Okay. Welcome to Hot Weekly. I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. This is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast for the haunted attraction industry. Everything from home haunts to mega haunts and all the wonderful yummy haunts in between. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be the podcast for you. Back for episode 21. Wow. Our our, our show's old enough to drink now. Yay! That's good, because we are. That's because we're about to say, <laughs> this show's been drinking since episode one. I don't know what to do. Yeah. That's okay. Brought to you by rum. <laughs> well, and nice. other stuff. And other stuff. <laughs> yes, but um, glad to have you back for another edition of Haunt Weekly. I'm excited about this topic this week. We, I think we picked an important one. Because yeah. in a weird way, when I said actor, owner, aficionado, this one actually is targeted at one of those groups. Yeah. The actors. Well. And and people who want to keep actors. Yeah, owners. Cause owners do, fair enough. Finding actors is really hard. It is. That's what she said. Oh, God. It's going to be one of those episodes. I've been working in the yard all day. It's going to be whatever kind of episode I want it to be. But, yes, it Fair will enough. be one of those episodes. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're talking about recruiting and keeping actors. And it's going to be a broad conversation. This is another one of those topics where I think some of the elements might get pulled out and might become separate conversations later. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm i looking at our show notes, and I know there's a couple of these bullet points. It's like, yeah, we could do an hour on that easy. Yeah. So, don't expect this to be an in-depth one. Expect this to be kind of a whirlwind tour of a topic. All right? All right. Sounds but, good. But let's start off with this um, episode. We actually have a lot of haunt convention updates we got to get through. Boy, do we ever. Yeah, I, I, I finally made it a point to sit down and find all the haunted attraction dimensions my grubby little hands could get their hand can be fine and put them into one set of notes. And we'll keep updating and providing progress on these as we go. Right. So, since we do not, since we have like a crap ton of these, we're just going to kind of do them qu- quick-ish right. as we go through. Also, uh, if anyone goes to them and wants to comment what they thought of them, yeah, let give us know. them a little review on... Find yeah. us on uh, Facebook and Twitter there, Haunt Weekly at both. Yeah. Let us know what you thought about these various conventions. We would love to hear your thoughts. We, we Obviously, we I don't think anyone can make it to all of these. <laughs> no. Hey, I think, there's, I think there's some time and space relativity problems here. Maybe a little bit. Um, and also, you know, it's just this is a lot of damn conventions. Um, so let's start off, and I got this roughly in chronological order. We're recording this on, um, recording this on April the Saturday, 23rd. April 23rd, and it'll be going live April 24th. So it's in chronological order from the 24th, basically. Yep. You ready to knock this out? Go. Most urgent, for those of you who do not know, is the West Coast Haunters Convention, April 29th through May 1st. There is still time to get your tickets and go. It is at the Doubletree Hotel in Portland, Oregon. And you can find more details at hauntersconvention.com. Next, we have Halloween Extreme. Extreme! (laughs) (laughs) May 15th through 17th. Also at Doubletree. Now what the only fuck is in... Doubletree kind of like a special <laughs> deal with honor? However, this Doubletree is in Universal Studios, Florida. Or Orlando, Florida. And that's HalloweenExtreme.com. Extreme! Sorry, that's a reflex. You should have done that one. I know, I should have. Um, after that, we have the Virginia Haunt Fest. It is June 3rd and 4th. It is at the Misty Mountain Camp Resort. i got to say, checking out the site, it looks flipping gorgeous out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Check it out. It's aimed exclusively at Virginia Haunters, though I'm sure if you're nearby, they'll welcome you. I I have no idea, actually. But it says it's for Virginia Haunters, and it is at VirginiaHauntFest.com. Next, we have Midwest Haunters Convention, June 10th through 12th, Greater Columbus Convention Center, Tour of Scaratorial. Is one of the the benefits. Yeah, and... It's the Friday night tour. Yeah. Friday night. Friday, no, no. And you can find more information on that one at MidwestHauntersConvention.com. Very particular there. Midwest Haunt Ors Plural Convention. Don't get that one wrong. 
you'll probably go to a porn site or something. I have no idea where it'll take you. I'm, I'm, I'm too scared to try. We should try. We should try. Okay. <laughs> After that, it is Chicago Frights. It is July 29th through 31st at Orland Park, Illinois. Um, it's at the uh, Jojorio's Quality, and I'm sure I mispronounced that horribly. <laughs> and you can learn more there at chicagofrights.com. Predictable domain is predictable. <laughs> yes. And then Scare LA, August 6th through 7th, Pasadena Convention Center. In Pasadena, California. <laughs> yes. That's going to be at scarela.com for more information. Elvira's hosting this one. Yes. So. Uh, Elvira's hosting, and also, as we mentioned last week, right. the peoples behind McKamey Manor will be in attendance Correct. for that one. Um, finally, and this is getting a little close to haunt season for my taste, um, but there is Mask Fest, a makeup and uh, mask festival, if you will, for monsters and whatnot. It is right. at the Marriott Indianapolis East, that's Indianapolis, Indiana, and it is at maskfest.com. I screwed up the domain in the show. And, those, uh, and that was September 9th through 11th. 11th yes. And um, so I guess if you're, you know, in the need for that last minute mask, ah. mask fest would be the place to go. Yeah. Sounds like it. Uh, they do have a trade show floor, so yeah. you can pick up those I would last... hope that there are masks on the trade I would floor. hope so, too. I'd be very disappointed <laughs> if I showed up at mask fest and there were no masks. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, it's a Photoshop convention. They're Photoshop masks. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, totally. You stand in front of a green screen and exactly. they, they put the mask on you. I photos. totally, totally screwed up the convention. I went to the wrong convention. <laughs> oh my god. Um, that, that totally sounds like something I could do. So yeah, where uh, finding and recruiting and keeping actors. This is. The perennial discussion in the haunt community, it seems. Yeah. Every time haunters ask me anything about my haunt, it's usually two questions. One, how did you build it? And two is, how did you staff it? Yeah. That's Those are the questions in that order, usually. Yeah. And staffing is really difficult. And it and it's not just for small home haunts that staffing's difficult. No, it's every it's, haunt. It's every haunt that we've worked at. Every I've never been... I've never been involved with a haunt that has had no staffing issues whatsoever. Even if they have adequate people, like there are a couple of haunts we know that definitely have adequate people. Right. They have a tough time finding adequate good people. Yeah. There's always you know there's always an issue is what I'm saying. Or they have trouble finding the right people. Yeah. They've got all these great scare actors, but they need builders and behind the scenes people. Or they have all these great behind the scenes people, and they need more scares. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always something. You know, there's always something wrong. And like, you know, we've, we've talked before about 13th Gate, how they have enough so they have auditions and they only let about half the people who audition actually act. They have enough headcount, but what they make up, what they lack in headcount, they often complain they do not have enough of particular types of actors. They often struggle to fill specific roles. Right. And you can tell... Which of their actors are new because they're in behind drop panels and, yeah. you know, Necrop Necropolis. Yeah, and, and, and then put that in perspective really fast. And this is, like I said, this is one of the most telling things. 13th Gate is hands down the haunt that has the most number, you know what I mean, is most selective about their actors that I know of. Yeah, in I, I would agree with the stories that I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah, based upon what I know from talking to the owners and people who work there, they are the most selective, other than like hell houses and so forth. Yeah. In terms of um, that's like that was last that was a previous week. We're not going back to that yeah, one. No. I got too pissy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> too much blood pressure being raised. Go back and listen to the episode. Um, um, but no, the thing I find interesting though is they they only take half the people. But that means that if you're perfectly average in every possible way, you still have a slot. Right. And that's telling for our industry that. That's the reality, is that even, you know, mediocre actors can get a slot at a top-tier haunt, because staffing is such a trouble, such trouble. And, you know, we face these problems, every haunt does. So we wanted to go into some of the stuff we've learned, both in our experiences and in talking with others. Yeah. And so I wanted to, the way I organize the show notes, and I know we may go off them this go-around, is sort of the, the process of recruiting and keeping actors. Right. Start with where to flipping find people. Yeah. Um, now, 
And in this list, I, the way I viewed it is this. Start as close to you as you can. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of small businesses start with family members. Yes. And haunts are no different. Exactly. Family and friends often work in haunts, and they're often part of the core group that are there every year and are the most reliable people. Yes. I mean, our haunt in particular is staffed, I would say, about 60% by close friends and family. Yeah. And the other 40% is made up by people further afield in our um, contact list. Right. But they they have become friends. Oh, yeah. They become friends, but we met That's, them first. Yeah. We met them first um, through various means. One of them, actually, that has been with us for a couple of years, uh, great actor, and uh, he was a visitor to the haunt. Yeah. And then contact and that's us one saying, group, hey. And that's one group I did not put in here. I'm going to add them in and later on then. Um, yeah. <laughs> visitors to your haunt. It actually is a really good group. Um, well, it doesn't always work out, but yeah. it can work out. But, yeah, but, so start with your family and friends, though, obviously. That's just pure logic. Right. You know, your your siblings, your your nieces, your nephews, your uncles, your good friends you've had since college or whatever. Start with people you know, start with people you trust. They're going to be among your most reliable and they're the easiest people to approach about it. Right. And and I do think that this is more set for small starting out haunts. Yeah. Not for people who go in with, into this with lots of money and just all of the, you know, ability in the world to recruit from every which avenue oh. from the get-go. But even then, you probably want to at least bring a couple people in from your close circle. I don't know. I don't know that that people who view it strictly as a business and don't have... Because you can definitely tell when a haunt has a love, like a haunter in charge of it, and when they have just a businessman. <clears throat> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So, the next group to reach out to is any group you're a member of. If you've had a long-standing alliance, um, and that could be almost anything. Any group you've been a member of from PTA, student associations, neighborhood associations, chambers of commerce, anything. Any group you have a long-standing membership with and good connections in can be great. Yeah. Because, you know, odds are you've done things for other members in that group. They might, be, if they especially have an interest in haunting and scaring people, they might be willing to do things and help you. Right. That's kind of what these groups are for, is to help each other out. No. Yeah. Um, and so always, you know, start there. That helps, too. Um, from there, if you're a volunteer haunt, I propose you find any place that has a volunteer board and get on there. Yeah. Even if you're not a charity haunt, um, there's a lot of places that are just looking for, you know, you know, hey, I need volunteers to do something, even if it's not formal volunteer work. Um, one thing we've learned over the years is military bases and so forth often have volunteer lists. Right. Uh, Those do like to work with um, registered charity yes, haunts. That's, they prefer registered charity haunts, but you can, you might be able, even if you're not a registered charity haunt, you might be able to pick up a few people. Right. There is interest there, and there are, right. and here's a shock, there are people in the military who like Halloween. Really? I know, I, it blew my mind, yeah. too. Totally came out of nowhere. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, other people in this group would be community groups, colleges, high schools, local theaters. Local groups. theater groups, yeah. Um, local Rocky, Rocky Horror Troops yeah. would be great for this if they don't have a showing on Halloween. They probably have a showing on Halloween. They probably do, but um, but they might know people. Yes. Um, if you are offering a paid haunt, and we'll be talking more about paid versus free in a little bit, mm -hmm. um, check out your local newspaper and post the ad there. Um, and the reason I say that is because it's something we've noticed when job hunting is that yes, there's all these great forms. There's like, you know, we're talking about Craigslist and all that. Um, local newspapers are still where the bulk of job seekers and where job posters go. And yeah. In, and any local site that is dedicated to job hunting in your area is good too. Right. Now, I have seen um, the local haunts here post on Craigslist. Yeah. And, then, and 
and not so much in the newspaper. Yeah. And I think that's kind of kind of a missed opportunity. Yeah. Because I get why they do, but at the same time, a lot of job seekers almost never check out Craigslist because Craigslist can be a bit of a cluster duck. Yeah, it, it can. Um, I find that I'm much more skeptical of the jobs listed on Craigslist, I, I agree. especially in the gig section. Yes. But since they put their haunt name in the ad, yeah. at least I know who they are, you know? Um, another option we just came up with, and I just added to the show notes, recruit your visitors. Yeah. My God, this one's so simple. On your website, have a volunteer or, you know, jobs link or whatever. In line, have a like haunted houses, want to work your poster and give them an email address or somewhere to contact. Right. Don't, don't tell them to contact you right then. They're like, you're open. That's stupid. We've <laughs> actually um, done dual flyers. Mm-hmm. One that was put out early for anybody interested in working in the haunt, and then the actual flyers for the haunted house itself in those same locations a little bit later. Yeah, and that works out really well, too, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's Gorilla real, marketing. That's, that's really good if you have a more limited run. And you can get your flyers out in September and not miss any days. If you're doing a longer run and you have to get the recruiting starting earlier, that might not work as well. Yeah. But at the, the same time, you know, be thinking, if you're thinking about recruitment in advance, put the flyers out as you're recruiting. Right. Um, and I noticed that the, uh, the local ones start advertising about August. Yeah. Usually it's July, August. Yep. Somewhere in that range. Um, post relevant sites online. We mentioned Craigslist a little while ago. Yep. One we have gotten a lot of help from is the local Reddit, the local su- local subreddit, right. or whatever your our town New is. Orleans. <laughs> for us, it's our New Orleans. For you, it could be our San Diego or whatever. Or whatever. Or, or, yeah. Exactly. Whatever your local Reddit community is, post there. Right. There are also um, Halloween subreddits. I am a member of those. Um, so what's up? <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. But uh, yeah. There, there are Halloween subreddits, and there are Halloween um, owner, haunter owner subreddits, too. Yes. So, keep those in mind. Yeah, keep those in mind. Those are great just to have in your back pocket anyway. Yep. May not be great for actor recruitment, because you want to keep it local for this, because this is a geo- geography problem. Yeah. But, yeah, you are, whatever your town is, look it up. There's a good chance that you will find a community there. That is very open to you posting there, especially if you know, because that's the thing about the, especially in the Reddit communities, mm-hmm. people there are always looking for stuff to do. You know what I mean? People are always looking for things to do on those communities mm-hmm. and what's happening in the city, what's going on today. Um, so this is a chance to make a suggestion for how to kill a few nights during Halloween season. Right. And finally, don't overlook. Oh, sorry. Not finally, but go ahead. Don't okay. overlook. Don't don't also don't overlook the idea of networking at Halloween and other related events. Right. The reason being, this is where you're going to meet some like-minded people. Go to your local Rocky Horror showings. Yeah. Talk to the people in the audience. Talk to the people in the audience. Talk to the people in the shadow cast. Tell them who you are, what you run. See if they're interested. Bring business cards. Yeah. Network at these things. Meet your like-minded people in the local community. This is really, really useful if you're one of those business haunts that you're talking about. Right. And maybe you don't have roots in the community. This is a great way to meet people who are interested in this and bring them on board. Right. And there are also um, local actor guilds that you can get in touch with um, if you want. And there are roaming scare actors. Yes. People who will go cross-country to act in your haunted house. They do expect to be paid more because they have created a character specifically that you are hiring that character. Yeah. Not even that person, just that character. Yeah, don't... Which don't. is pretty cool, and you can find those guys online. Yeah. So, definitely worth checking out. There's there, Basically, what it comes down to is this. There are a lot of ways to recruit actors. Yep. But for the most part, other than those roaming actors you just described, right? Um, which you definitely don't want to base your entire haunt acting cast on. Oh that. It's no, it's too no, expensive, no. and yeah. But it might be good if you need one star or one celebrity, you know, someone like that. 
right. that come in and appear. Um, the main thing is focus on your geography, meet the people close to you, recruit them, and if you have an environment that is appealing to them, they will come. Mm-hmm. And that is all there is to it. Now, one of the questions everyone has about recruiting actors, and this is something that's hotly debated, is to audition or not audition. Right. And you'll find we don't have any good answers here. Yeah. Just a I morning. have a preference. Okay. Although we don't use it. <laughs> yeah, you would prefer to audition. I would. I would prefer to have enough people want to show up to audition that way I can get an idea of where they want to be in the haunt, what roles would be the best for them, you know, and what their abilities are. Yeah. Now, like, the main everybody can do something. Yeah. It's just finding that. Well, the main purpose of auditions are to weed out candidates if you have a glut. Mm-hmm. If you have too many people who want to apply. Right. And like I said, I think the only time I've really seen that completely and totally is in the documentary for Hell House. Well, but remember, House of Shock had enough people applying to them that Kyle was cut for not being able to make one of the yeah. movies. Yeah, well, I mean, so. and, and that's... They, to my, my understanding is they don't have auditions. What they have are... You have to meet these requirements, and they're pretty high requirements. Right. But it's not an audition per se. Yeah, I'm not sure. On that. I, I'm, I've not heard of them having auditions. We should ask. We should ask, but I've not or heard... Or you guys can tell us. You guys can tell us. But yeah, I've not heard of them having like actual auditions, except for maybe for specific roles. But just in general for being on cast, mm -hmm. it seems like most haunts are, if you show up on time, you come to the meetings, you've got a, a place. Yeah. That place may be behind a drop panel in some random corner of the haunt, yeah. but you've got a place. Um, and then the reason for that is because very, very few haunts have an honest to God glut of actors. They, they, very few have so many people that want to be a part of it that they need it to be selective. Right. I mean, I, we are well, usually overstaffed. Yeah. But we're usually overstaffed to a degree we can still find jobs. Right. Well, and then also, um, you know, gives actors chances to relax and switch out exactly. roles and things because you can cross train or you can have just a backup actor. So, Hey, you go take a 15 minute break, let this guy come in or a 30 minute break yeah. or whatever. And I know at, um, universal, they, they hire 5,000 people mm -hmm. and half of them do, um, the shift at a time. Yeah. A shift and B shift type thing. Right. Exactly. And they, they swap in and out. Yeah. Right. Because there's 2,500 working at almost any time. Or right. probably even less than that, honestly, because you have some days that are off and so yeah. forth. But yeah, you don't have 5,000 actors working every millisecond is what it comes down right. to. Right. That's ridiculous. Yeah, but you have to be able to pull that many together. Yes. Um, you know, but that being said, auditions come with some hazards. They can yeah. create tension, stress, and they can hurt feelings, too. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that comes more from the way you hold the auditions and the way you approach giving people news that they don't want to hear. Fair. You know, than it does from the process of holding auditions. And and one of the problems is we we've talked a lot in previous episodes and some in this one too about trying to build a hot family. Right. We want the haunt to be a family. Auditions make it competitive. Well, okay, so Here's the thing, is that I think you should have auditions for new people. Maybe do a split. Have auditions for new people, but people that you've been working with, you know what you, they can do. And you just grow that relationship over the year, and that way they want to keep coming back. Yeah. Okay. That, that's my thought on that. Okay. Fair enough. Um, we did a whole thing on how to keep your actors. <laughs> yeah. Well... <laughs> And one of the keys there, though, is that I find that auditions work best in haunts that pay their actors. Well, yeah. I, I, I and that's a general rule, because when they're when it's treated more as a job, the audition makes more sense. Right. This is the job application. Well, yeah, exactly, and that's one of the advantages of an audition is that it puts the person coming to apply 
in the headspace that this is a job and I have responsibility to show up and do a great job. And yeah, and, and one of the things to remember though is, and this is the old beggars can't be choosers thing sometimes, auditions work really, really well and are best when you have two to three times the number of people applying that you need at a given moment. Right, because if you have to take whatever you can get, then you have to take whatever, whatever you can get. get. And sometimes quality does suffer from that, and that's something you and have to weigh whenever you're thinking about you this. Put, you, you, as the owner, have to know what people's strengths and weaknesses are. You have to take someone who is you know, maybe a weaker actor and put them in a role where that weakness doesn't shine as strong. You right. put them in a role with limited interaction with customers. Right. Maybe it's a high scare role like a drop panel, but one with limited interaction. Yeah, a drop panel, a only seen for a few seconds yeah. as they rush towards you or something. You find something. You find some way that their weakness, and doing that does let them hone their craft. Yeah. And that's that's the thing I've seen in various years is sometimes actors that start out rough. <laughs> Yeah. And you stick them in a terrible place thinking, well, you know, at the very least, you know, they're not going to be too involved with the customers. They really take to the role. They study it. They learn it. And they practice it. And after doing hundreds of iterations of just this few seconds, they nail their timing. They nail their screen. They nail their approach. They know when to attack, how to attack. And they get pretty damn good. Yeah. I've watched over a couple of seasons. I've worked front of house. Or actors that we put in there and thought opening night, you know, yeah. oh god, this is rough. And by the end of the night, I'm hearing people talk about in the Halloween night. I'm hearing people going, "Wow, that kid was good." Yeah, you know, I've had that. That happens more than once. So be thinking about that. But yeah, you have to be able. I mean, basically, in my opinion, if you don't have two times the people you need, then you have alternatives to auditions. You can yeah. rotate people. You can make surplus roles. You can put more people behind the scenes. You can find ways to use those people. Right. And long story short, it's but you know a weak actor is in, a weak actor is better than no actor. Right. In most cases, there are exceptions to that rule, but a weak actor who can operate a drop panel and can time things reasonably is better than not having a scare at all. Right. It's better than an empty haunt. Yes. And because we've been through some empty haunts, we've been through some very empty haunts. And That's so my advice, yeah, my advice there is if you have more than two X the number of people you need, start having auditions. Yeah. If you have, if you have only two times the people you need, start thinking of ways you can shift people in and out. Start thinking of additional roles you can open up. Start thinking of alternating days. Start thinking about how you can use those extra people to improve the reliability and the of the scares and the reliability of having warm bodies where you need them, right. rather than trying to cut people who are weaker actors. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And also, if you're holding auditions, remember that that's a great time to get promises on times that Agreed. people will be available. And if there are any contracts to be signed, yes. that's the time to do that. Yeah, stuff. absolutely. That yeah, the, the audition. I know it should go without saying, but I'm saying. Well, you know, I mean, auditions are job interviews at the end of the exactly. day. Exactly. So all the crap you would do at a job interview, or especially like a latter stage job interview, right. do here. That's yep. what I'm saying. Okay, actor training. Okay, you recruited your actors. How are we going to train them? No. Hmm. Um, one thing to do is especially with very new actors, give them several sayings that they can say. Yeah. Here are here's something you can build off of. Yeah. Here, get you started. Think of it as scare 101 type stuff. Yeah. You can say this. You can do this. This is how you scream. This is how you pop out. This is how you time a scare. Right. Very, very... I mean, and that's just it. Even if people instinctively know this, when you are in the trenches for your very first night acting in a haunt... It's easy to forget this stuff. It is. It's and, super easy to, believe me. And so basically what you want to do, if if your time and your actor's um, time constraints allow, is to do several training nights leading up to when you open. Yes. Um, so that everything can get down. 
also you want to make sure that they know what they can't do. Yes. And Set what your would boundaries. be inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about, you know, politics, we've talked about <laughs> adult content haunts before. Yeah. All that stuff comes out here. As well as, you know, things like cursing and touching. Touching versus no touching, smoking, drinking, mm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we have, have seen, seen it. We have seen very good haunts have nights destroyed by actors bringing in drugs and alcohol and actually getting the police involved. Right. We were, we were I, not involved in the drinking and drugs. No. We were in the wrong damn part of the haunt. Yes. We were in apparently the boring part of the hall, not the interesting part yeah. that time, that night. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> we were in the wrong part. But, yeah, I remember we were down, like, four actors yeah. by the end of that. Yeah. And it was a haunt where maybe the nightly cast was... Twelve? Ten to twelve. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was thinking ten to twelve in that range. It, it depends on how you count the owners. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. That's, that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was like 10 to 12 people, so that puts us down a third to a half almost. Yeah. And yeah, the whole section of the haunt sucked for the duration of the night because most of the people in there were either going to the doctor or were yeah. um, being um, were, were trying to get away from the home detail police officer. Oh my God. Yeah. It was, it was a horrible night. Horrible night. Yeah. One of my worst haunting experiences ever. What, wasn't that the night I was working the ticket booth? It was. I think it was yeah. the night I was working the ticket booth. Yeah, oh god, that was a terrible night. We'll have to, we'll have to tell the full story later at some point. Mm. Um, but I, yeah. I know we've mentioned it before. But it, yeah. it, we we have to do a whole episode about our favorite stories. Okay. Um, one thing about actor training: never train for specific roles. And that this is pretty big to me because you want actors to be able to pop in and out to the roles they're needed. Give them the basic skills and tell them how to be a character, but not for a specific character. Now, later on, after you've recruited them, brought them in, and you're sure that you're confident in them, right. you can do that. Yeah, well, and the other thing is, is if you are one of those haunts that have two or three actors per every role, then you can teach them yeah, for you, that you role. You have a little more flexibility there, I agree. Yeah. But in general, the first priority, at the very least, is general stuff. How to scare, how to be a character, how to time stuff, how to be safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. From there, if you have the manpower, if you have the expertise and the knowledge, then you can start teaching a specific character. Right. Well, and the other thing is, is if one of your actors starts to really shine, yeah, then you can move them to a front and center role. Agreed. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... But that's one of the things I see that's very frustrating at haunts is they'll bring someone brand new in and they'll say, you, you are going to be the priest in the exorcism room or whatever. And they will train him specifically to be the priest. Yeah. And okay, we're down a few people one night in the middle of the season. The priest in the exorcist room isn't the most important role. He needs to move up to something that's even more customer interacting right that becomes a problem because he has no experience with switching roles right try and if you have a small enough haunt it's a good idea to familiarize everybody with every role and how it fits into the bigger picture so that way they can pop in at least on an emergency basis what you don't want is a situation where one of your actors gets sick i.e. they brought in moonshine or something <laughs> and or you have, genuinely get sick. Or genuinely get sick. <laughs> so we've had that happen. Or have an emergency and have to leave, and then you have no one that can fill that role. No one with even a concept of how that role works. Right. You just have an empty chair. Oh, that's sad. It is. Um, I I personally think, and this is just me talking here, you should keep the training you give to a the for the required training for new actors to a minimal. Keep them safe, keep them skill, get them the skills they need, and let them, you know, work on their roles and their characters on their own. And I know you're going to disagree with me. Okay, so if you pair them up with a more seasoned actor, then I'm okay with that statement. Yeah. Because the seasoned actor will help train. Yeah. 
That that would be the, right. that's the ideal situation. Yeah. <laughs> you have a day or two, maybe an afternoon or two, of tr- preseason training, and then they team up with someone who's more experienced in the room, who kind of helps grow them. Yeah. And and the reason is this: there's only so much you can do in preseason training. I mean, this is this is war. You can only learn so much in basic training. You know. Right. You can only pick up so much. And a lot of haunts will have, you know, week after week after week of training and classes and et cetera. And it sounds great, but it doesn't necessarily produce better actors. Yeah. Now, I will say, as someone who has been an, in an actor role mm-hmm. um, for someone else's haunt, one of the worst things is to show up and you have, and they have no idea where they want you. Yeah. I agree. I mean, that's that's just because then you basically are telling me, okay, you have no idea where your scares are, and you want me to make something up. And you have not prioritized your scares in any way, right? So you're putting all of the burden on me. You got to figure it out. As I agree, that's that's terrible. That's terrible. And that's not that's not a good way to run it. That's not a good way to run it. And but you know, from a training standpoint, try to minimize the burden on both the actor and yourself. Teach what's necessary, and you're just at some point you've got to trust the actor to pick it up. Oh yeah. And season. There, at some point, sanity has to kick in, and you just realize this is war. And when the bullets start flying, they're going to figure it out. To yeah. duck, you know. It's, yeah. It's one of those well, things. And if they don't, then you know that they need extra help. Yeah. Um, when you can give it. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why it's a good idea for your first few nights of the season to have the discount nights and to have, you know, because those are definitely more trial runs for both you, your actors, and the audience. Right. So, yeah, that, that's a good time to sort of weed some of that out. Um, and also, like I said, we train mostly it's for newer actors. Yeah. Your experienced actors probably already know what ends up if you tell them you need them to be a ghoul in the ghoul room or they're going to, you know, be behind a drop panel or whatever. They're going to know what to do with it. Yeah. Just have a little faith in that and trust them if they're genuinely experienced. Okay. Now, with actors, there's one question that always comes up for haunts. Paid versus unpaid. And this one, I this is the topic I immediately knew would be a full episode another day. Yes, it will. Okay. So, we're going to blow through this pretty quickly. Um, both have their advantages, in my mind. Um... Paid actors, you are able typically to recruit higher quality actors. Yes. We, more than once in our haunt, we're a free home haunt, have lost some of our better actors to haunts that pay in this area. Right. And because I, we just couldn't. We, we, we're a free home haunt. We have no business structure whatsoever. We can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, other haunts can pay. I can't blame these guys if they want to earn money. Nope. I, I have no animosity All the best to them. whatsoever. Typically speaking, when it's a job, you get better and they be, actors become more reliable, both in terms of their performance that they give right. and in terms of their attendance. Yes, because it, cause expectations are set from the get-go of what you know is needed of them. They need to be here at this time, for this amount yeah. of time, and they will get paid this much. And they know that they will be paid for the time they are there. Right. And so they know what's expected of them. There's a time card or some kind of system usually to track it. Um, you know immediately what's going on and what ends up. Now, I'm not saying it means perfect attendance or perfect performance quality or whatever. It does. It just means it's typically higher Right. Um, in that. And that's, like I said, it, it, that's speaking in a pretty broad stroke. And, and the reason is because it's just taken more seriously by the actors. Right. The actors view this as a job. It's a source of income, even if it's a secondary source of income. Because that's one of the things I've noticed is a lot of the actors that work in paid haunts have other better paying jobs elsewhere. Right. It's just that little bit of money helps them, A, justify taking time out of their e- nights and evenings to do it. Mm-hmm. And it also encourages them to treat it more like a second job rather than just a hobby that they can drop or goof off at or, you know what I mean, not treat with any kind of gravitas. Right. And I do think that it is important to pay your actors. I agree. That's just my take. But the there are advantages of 
having uh, unpaid well, and, and they, volunteer uh, actors. Too. And then the reason the advantage of unpaid one, it's cheaper. Duh. Duh. <laughs> Duh. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I find environments in unpaid haunts tend to be a bit more family like. Right. This is one of the things we hear when we talk to actors in paid versus unpaid haunts. Yeah. It is unpaid haunts, they're like a club. Yeah. They go, they hang out, they have parties, they go drinking afterwards. Right, there are a lot of benefits outside of the haunt yeah. to knowing your group of people. Exactly. Um, un- <coughs> I'm sorry, in paid haunts, you don't see as much of that. Every paid haunt we've spoken to an actor about, yeah. it's they show in, they clock in, they work together as a team to get the job done, they clock out, they disperse. Yeah. Unless it, it's, they the actors take it upon themselves to hang out by themselves. Hello, karaoke guys. Um. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> but it's very similar to like an office environment at that point. Yeah, and that's what it's been described as. It's very office and business like, and um, it also has been said that some of the paid haunts, at least, remove some of the creativity. Yeah. Um, from the actors. Because yeah, once you're paying, you have more of that top-down control. Right. And that produces... That that can be a sense of frustration with actors. Yeah. Because with unpaid haunts, everyone's kind of there for their own enjoyment. Right. And their own entertainment. And so they take more initiative to find ways to make it better. Well, and not only that, but the actors have the upper hand. Yeah. Because those owners need them. Yeah. They really need them to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and... But one of the interesting things I find, and this is like a weird dichotomy thing, I find actors in unpaid haunts are often willing to work harder and yeah. do more than those in paid haunts. And the reason is because, you know, they'll be there for builds. Right. They'll be there. And part of that's because, like you said, they're getting input into this. The, the owners need them. And so then if they're there when the haunt's being built, they have a lot of say in how it's built. Right. They feel like they're needed. They feel they're wanted. They feel that um, they have a, some sort of creative control over what they are doing in the hall. So all in all, they're not just another brick in the wall. Right, so exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, and realistically, in my opinion, and like I said, this is a topic for a, a whole other day. Um, in the end, this is a choice about the culture of your haunt. Yeah. Do you want it to be more business like or more club like? Mm-hmm. And that there's there's no right or wrong answer there. I've seen great haunts that were both ways. Right. But I do believe you should consider paying your actors things important. And one of the things that I that doesn't get explored a lot in haunting right. is these hybrid systems. Yeah, it's something that we've talked about yeah. for whatever We go pro. We go pro. Um and this is the idea is that the profits are are split in some way among the actors and the owners. After, you know, all the costs are taken out, that yeah, way it's still a family kind of volunteer thing, but they also get a lot more out of it and yeah. still have some control. Yeah, I mean, issue shares for hours work. Issue is one system yeah. that you could use. Um well, we will talk about all of those yeah, no, no, uh, different ideas. But the, 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 but the basic phone. idea here is to find a way in which you're paying actors, but not losing some of that club mentality either. Right. And you're not losing some middle some, ground. The, the, a middle ground where you're paying, rewarding, and giving actors, you know, financial compensation for their time, but at the same time, it's not just punch in, punch out, go home. Yeah. You, there's got to be a middle ground. Um. So, you found your actor, you trained them, you've decided whether you're paying them or not. How do you retain them? There are lots of ways to do that. And I think the the first area to focus on is safety and comfort, obviously. Yeah. This goes back to the uh, the talk of, of the haunt mom's role. Yeah. Or dad's, I guess. Yeah. Um, haunt parent. There we go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I mean, obviously, remove all physical danger. Yeah. From for the actor. And that's something that gets overlooked a surprisingly large amount. Yes. Haunts will go to incredible lengths to check and make sure that a haunt is safe for customers mm-hmm. and then completely screw the pooch when it comes to their actors. Yeah. Yeah. So, safety first, obviously. 
And then for comfort, make sure that you have snacks and drinks available, you know? Haunting's really intense. Yeah, and you've got to be able to present opportunities for people to switch roles, to change out, and get some variety. Especially if a role is something that requires a person to stay in a particular position for a long period of time. Yes. There can be great discomfort, great unease. Right. And, yeah, if you have the ability to switch out and move people from role to role, then it can be very, very beneficial. And obviously breaks. Yeah. <laughs> breaks are super important. Oh, my God. And I know, because the thing is about it is this. Typical haunt is open four to five hours a night, four to six hours a night. Yeah. Depending upon, you know, their exact timetable. Um, that doesn't sound like a person should need a break, but this is very physically, mentally demanding. Yes, a break or two is needed. Yeah. And if you can't, you know, stop the haunt for a few minutes, then what you've got to do is you've got to have other people you can tag in and out to those roles. Right. And you mentioned the haunt mother or haunt parent role. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this I this is kind of like an ombudsman thing. Yeah. You have someone there who represents the actor's interest that isn't one of the owners. Yes. Someone there that is in charge of caring for the needs, physical, emotional, and otherwise, of the actors. Yes. Um, they you know, provide food, drink, and support. Um, and they're not there necessarily to haunt. They're there for the people. Yeah. Making and, sure that they're doing good. And, you know, the thing I, the thing that I found interesting, I was thinking about this as I was doing these show notes. Ellie is our haunt mom. Yeah. Ever since we've had her in the two years, we've two seasons we've had her. Right. We have not lost an actor. Yes. We have gained actors during that time. Yes. No one has bailed on us. No one has left us. Everyone has showed up. And one of the reasons, I think, is Ellie's there to provide food, to provide drinks, and provide comfort and so assistance that we can't provide because we're too damn busy running the haunt. Right. Especially on Halloween night when we're putting, you know, hundreds of people through. Yeah. Through our garage. Yeah. Hundreds of people through our garage. Uh yeah, there's barely time for any breaks. Yeah. And so being able to just have somebody to do the runs for the drinks and snacks and stuff is very, very helpful. Yeah, we, that, that is, having the haunt mom role, Phil, has improved our retention by umpteen right. bajillion percent. Uh, that's the actual number. I did the math. Okay. Gotcha. Um, also, um, remember to have events throughout the year to get together with your actors to stay in touch. If nothing else, a Facebook page yeah. for your actors. A Facebook page for your actors is great. Also, stay in touch with your actors via Facebook. Right. Follow what they're doing. Comment, like, share, talk to what they're doing. Talk to them. Yeah. Tweet at them. Instagram with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do all that. Be connected with them in the off season. Um, and this one is one area. And the final one is an area where I think most haunt, a lot of haunts have had trouble. Removing bad apples. Yeah. This one's tough. Because sometimes the bad apples, the people that are causing the problem, are those that have been with you the longest and those that you're sometimes closest to. Well, and it's not only that, but they can also disguise themselves as not bad apples. Yeah. Like, they're starting stuff, but you don't realize they're starting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you get enough people together, and especially in, like, haunt communities and so forth, which we tend to attract people that are the various fringes of society sometimes. Yeah. There are going to be a handful of troublemakers. Most ninety <laughs> plus percent of people are going to be good and wonderful and just want to scare people and be a team yeah. and rah rah and all that. But there's going to be a few people that are just drama magnets or problems and starting fights and stuff. Get them out, yeah, quickly. Yeah. And I have watched once again good haunts be ripped apart because the owner refused to turn away people that were causing problems. Right. And we're doing things that were in violation of the rules. We're starting disagreements and drama with other people. And... Trying to pit people against each other. Yeah. That kind of stuff, which you might not, you know, automatically recognize. Yeah. Because it's an internal between the actors. Exactly. It, it's one of those things where if you have someone who's causing problems... 
get rid of them. It is better to be understaffed than to have someone like that on staff. Right, because they're because cancerous. That they are cancerous, they will bring down the mood, the quality of acting, everything for the entire cast. Right, morale plummets. Plummets, and, you know, like I said, I've been involved in haunts where that's been going on, and it's rough. Yeah. I remember more than a few times making the drive out to act in a haunt and thinking, why are we doing this? Yeah. So-and-so is going to be there. We're going to be miserable. It's, you know what I mean? Right. It's, it's just a really stressful situation to put everybody in. Yeah. You know, why, are, why are we doing this to ourselves? Do we really love this enough to put up with this person? And, yeah, it sucks. You, you don't make your actors make those decisions. Nope. If you can. Um, yeah, and, and cause this is a, a, a team-first moment. You're thinking of the team, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's admittedly a, a, a quick run-through. But basically, for me, what it amounts to is this. Treat actors with respect and make your haunt a place actors want to be and they'll be there. Right. It's really that simple. You can make it a place they want to be through paying them, either directly or indirectly. But I think the more important way to make it somewhere they want to be is through offering them a safe fun, creative outlet. Right. You know, and and if you do it well enough, actors will fight to return. You know, I get Facebook messages all year long from our actors. I can't wait for on season again. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have such a good time. Yeah. Oh, save my spot. <laughs> 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 and I love that Um, because <clears throat> that's what acting should be. It should be fun. It should be a safe island, even if it is a paid position. It'd be something people look forward to. Right. So that I think that's really the crux of the argument. Yeah. Treat and it's all about respect and safety at the end of the day. Any final thoughts? Anything that you want to throw out? No. I think we've just about done it. Yeah. So real quick, where can people find us? On the internet. Oh, the internet. Oh, the internet's a big place. You might have to run around a little bit more. The web. The web. Okay, so we've eliminated you know, using that. Thank you. <laughs> that was a big bucket of help you provided. <laughs> On that note, everyone, please feel free to find us at hauntweekly.com. We are currently available on iTunes, Stitcher, and now on Google Play. Wow. Google Play uh, just recently opened up podcast, and we were in the first group allowed back in. Yay. Yeah, they clearly had absolutely zero standards for that. They haven't heard <laughs> They didn't <laughs> listen to a minute of this crap. Um, <laughs> um, but on that note, you can also find us on Twitter at Haunt Weekly, on as Facebook as Haunt Weekly. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Follow us and subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever finer podcasts are sold. We lie and sneak in there. And yes, and send us any suggestions or requests. Any suggestions or requests. Like I said, we are listening. We uh, accept Facebook messages, Twitter tweets, and wherever else you want to contact us. We'll, we'll, we got to get a good email address and other things set up, too. We haven't done that yet. Why not? Podbean's kind of weird. It's in... in, in you don't okay. have a lot of control over the domain. Okay, anyway. What we need to do is set up a real <laughs> damn site is what we need to do. On that note. No, on that note, everyone, thank you very much for listening, and we will see you guys next week. <laughs>